I'm going to start by saying that I'm very well aware that trying to pass anything with regexes is a bad idea. Uh, what Remy's referring to is me trying to fix Showdown, uh, which is an already existing regex parser, I think, um, and failing miserably. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking. I'm going to be talking about Ghost, but I'm going to be talking about the open source project uh, and my experiences of managing it. Um, and uh, as Remy says, I'm Hannah in the real world, but uh, on the internet you'll probably find me as AirSDS. Um, and I'm not sure if we're going to have time for questions at the end, but feel free to tweet me questions and I'll reply to them when I'm done, or come and find me. I'll be around all day. Um, so. Very quickly, then, uh, an introduction to Ghost and what Ghost is. Uh, can I have a show of hands of how many of you have heard of Ghost and have an idea already of what it is? That's amazing. Look around this room. This is fantastic. Uh, OK, so I'm going to do a really quick elevator pitch, then, of just to make sure that everyone's up to speed. I'm going to tell you the, the five things that you need to know about Ghost to understand this talk. Number one is that it's a blogging platform. That's all it is. Uh, number two is that the focus is on creating a beautiful, minimal user interface which delivers an awesome writing experience. It's all about stripping it back and making writing fun again. And we do that with a, a Markdown editor, which is split screen so that you use Markdown on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, you see your HTML preview. The third thing that you need to know, we've already touched on it, is it's written in Node.js. And fourth, it's not only open source, it's also non-profit. Uh, we're backed by a non-profit foundation called Ghost Foundation, and that means that every penny that we raise has to be spent on developing the software further. And the fifth point, which sort of backs this up, is that we, are, we have a sustainable business model. Uh, the Ghost Foundation runs a hosting service, which we call Ghost Pro, and you can come and pay us a monthly fee, and we will host your blog for you. Uh, and again, every penny that we raise through this process uh, funds the development of the software, which hopefully makes the software better, makes more features, which should attract new users, more people to pay, uh, will pay for, for it, and so the cycle kind of continues. So this is our sort of master plan of what we're trying to achieve. This is Ghost. Um, so yeah, it's a design-focused, non-profit, open-source, sustainable blogging platform, and uh, I co-founded this with John and Olin uh, at the beginning of last year. Uh, was the sort of the time it first started to be heard about. Um, so my job at Ghost is, well, officially I'm the CTO, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm kind of managing the open source project. I'm dealing with, you know, I spend most of my time on GitHub. Um, and so I want to tell you the story of how, in over the last two years, Ghost has gone from being just a twinkle in my co-founder John's eye to being one of the most starred repositories on GitHub. Now... Before I start talking about that, I just kind of wanted to cover a little bit about open source and what it means. Um, I've kind of had my job done for me because Steve has already shown you an amazing open source project and the kind of hopes that we can have of what we could achieve if we all collaborate together in the open. Uh, but the open source movement fundamentally believes that developing source code in, or software in the open, and nowadays hardware as well, achieves better results than developing closed source software and hardware. Um, and that's because you can leverage the community, you can have peer review, you can have more people contributing, and that produces higher quality code, more reliability, more secure software. And there's another benefit as well, and that is that by taking away the cost of proprietary software, it reduces the barrier to entry. It means that almost anyone can have a go. And what we've seen that do over the last, what, 30, 40 years, is it's driven technological advances like the internet. The internet wouldn't be possible if we didn't have open source software. So every single one of you in this room is benefiting from open, software, open source software. Um, and if you are interested in the power and the benefit of open source, I've seen that my business partner is, uh, has got a draft of an essay that he's about to publish on it, so keep your eye out for that. Um, so having said all of that and talking about how much I believe in open source software, I'm going to now tell you the beginning of the ghost story and about how we gained some benefit from starting off being closed. Because, you see, in the beginning, there was no source code. There was nothing at all. There was just an idea. I'm going like to liken it to sort of like the Big Bang. You know, one minute there was nothing, and the next minute there was something. We had a prototype. We had an idea of how we might build uh, the software that we wanted to build. 
But we tried out lots of different solutions. There wasn't like one, moment, you know, one clear path from the beginning. The first version of Ghost was actually a plugin for WordPress. And uh, at a certain moment, we, we, we tried that out, and then we decided, actually, hey, how about we try building our own thing in Node? And we got to a point where we were comfortable with uh, the, the prototype that we had, that it was viable. And perhaps that was the moment at which we should have decided, hey, we'll open source this now, we'll put it on GitHub, and we'll show everybody. But we made a slightly different decision. We decided instead to do a Kickstarter campaign. And because we wanted to leverage Kickstarters to try and fund our project, and not just fund it, but to sort of really gauge whether there was uh, a market for the software, for whether people wanted it, would people literally put their money where their mouth was? Um, it meant that there were going to be some benefits to staying closed for just a little bit longer. Uh, first of all, we wanted to give people uh, who backed us on Kickstarter a reward. And we'd heard uh, quite a lot of horror stories about software projects that had promised physical goods as uh, rewards on Kickstarter, and then had to take their focus away from developing the software that they, that they were passionate about in order to sort of deliver hundreds of thousands of physical packets to people all the way around the world. And we didn't want that to happen to us. So what we did was we aligned the rewards for the Kickstarter, the, the Kickstarter, that's not a good typo. Uh, the Kickstarter um, rewards, what we did was we aligned them with our own goals. So we gave people the opportunity to get um, early access to the software, which of course required that it not be public yet. Um, but that meant that we could focus on building the software and sort of gave us an additional drive to get it done because you had all of these thousands of people going, hey, you know, is it ready yet? And also, being uh, closed at this point meant we could really build a bit of hype around the Kickstarter campaign, which was obviously really important to make sure that we met our targets. Um, I think if our like, cruddy little prototype had been open at that time, it would have been a lot harder to get people excited about the idea. But most importantly, it gave us a little bit of time to sort of take stock and plan this project that we wanted to build. Because up until this point, you know, it's been a bit crazy. You've got an idea, people love it, you start prototyping it, it's going well. You do a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, a Kickstarter campaign like absorbs your life for a month. Um, and we hadn't really stopped to think about what it was that we were going to be doing. We were going to be putting the software into, uh, on, onto GitHub and we were going to be making uh, it open source. And that meant we needed to build a community around it in order to get it, to be, to, to get it developed. Because I mean, we couldn't afford to just build it ourselves. It you know, would have taken forever. So you know, we sort of started to take stock and decide on things like the mission and particularly the scope of the software. It's really important for us at Ghost is that we are just a blogging platform and, and what that means and how you decide whether a feature should be in Ghost or shouldn't be in Ghost. And so, yeah, we sort of, you know, documented the values that we wanted to have and thought about the culture that we'd like to breed around the software and getting it developed in the open. Um, so we planned this transition process. Um, to go from closed to open. Now, transitioning into open source software, I think, is quite a hard thing to do, especially if you haven't really done it before. If you aren't used to the process of putting your code out there for the world to see, if you, you, know, you work for a company and all of your source code is just sort of private and internal, the idea of having like everyone's eyes on your code is quite, you know, it makes you feel quite afraid, I think. You're afraid of being judged. And I certainly felt that way, especially when you consider I was massively emotionally invested in the project, and I've been working away from, on it in my spare time um, for months and months and months. And I think you know, that transition is really quite hard. Um, but I can tell you that all of my fears were completely unfounded. It's actually, you know, the process of making your code open isn't one to be afraid of. It's actually one to embrace and to enjoy, because most people are actually really, really nice, constructive, and give you amazing feedback, and you learn loads. So. Um, Anyway, we planned this idea that we would go from closed to open by being invite only to start with. And that's not like invite only where you sign up and you get, an, get to use the software. This was, we advertised uh, very liberally that we were looking for people who wanted to help us build Ghost. People who would have perhaps been, normally been open source contributors, but were comfortable with the idea of working in private for a little while. And we asked those people to, um, to send us an email and, and register their interest. And uh, we emailed them all back with a very short questionnaire. 
And the idea of the questionnaire was to just sort of put sort of like a, a, a block in the way to make sure these people were genuinely invested in the project. They really wanted to get involved. Like writing me another email would take a little bit of effort. And it also, you know, you could just check the general sanity of the person and make sure that they were definitely on board with the project. So we started out like this with uh, just seven or eight people involved to start with. Um, we put the very first prototype onto GitHub as a private repository and granted them access. Uh, and what happened with that group of people was absolutely amazing to witness. Um, so that very first prototype that I'm talking about was a really, really small express application that just about allowed you to write a post. Uh, it had a single unit test written in Node unit as a kind of indication that I thought there ought to be some tests, and, uh, which I'm really ashamed of, actually. Uh, and uh, I had written some documentation with the sort of the values and the culture that we, we hoped to achieve, which included some coding standards um, in which I very controversially said that I thought we should use JS Lint. Uh, because it's really, really strict. I wanted to go like the whole hog with, with standards and consistency. Um, and what happened was those, that group of people took that prototype and they turned it into a piece of software that worked. But they didn't just like, write the code. They took those sort of rough ideas, the idea of having a unit test. They added mocker and should and uh, wrote an entire set of unit tests. They wrote grunt tasks to run the unit test, wired it up with Travis, uh, or also wrote a grunt task to run JS Lint. There was a little bit of complaining, but everyone finally agreed that it was OK. Uh, but what's really interesting and, imp and important about that whole process that we went through is that I wasn't sat there enforcing my ideas or telling people they absolutely had to do things a certain way. I gave them a rough idea, and they built this, uh, they built this set of tools and processes themselves and sort of grew a culture out of the team rather than having it forced onto them. And of course, if people feel like things are their own ideas and they're on board with it, um, they're invested and they, you know, they feel much more happy about working on the project. And so we, we, we got very quickly to the point where we had these eight people that were working on the software that worked really well together. They, they had a real culture, a real community feel to it. And, um, we started having to make some big software decisions about what dependencies we wanted to use. Um, and those decisions, you know, we came to a, a way of making those decisions. We ended up with a process. Again, it sort of grew out of interacting with each other. And uh, that became shared history, things that we decided together, that we understood were how we decided decisions and what decisions we decided. And there, there were all these values and, and, and this sort of culture that grew itself on, on, on its own just by sort of pushing people off in one direction, and um, not the band. Uh, and so we moved towards the day when we were going to do a public launch. And uh, what we thought we would do is add new people uh, from the original email list every week, add a couple of people, and sort of practice what it felt like to have people come into the project, how they got on with it. Did they find the instructions uh, useful? Did they get stuck somewhere? Did they have questions? Were there things about the way they were, we were working that weren't clear? And so the documentations and the guidelines, they also sort of grew naturally out of that process. Um, and again, talking about documentation and guidelines, they reflect back the culture and the processes that the team embodies. They don't tell the team how to operate. It's not enforcing those ideas. In fact, guidelines and documentation get out of date really quickly as the team evolves its process. And you have to quick, keep, go back and, uh, and uh, tell, uh, sort of go back and update the documentation to reflect the new values and the new ideas and the new way you're working as you learn and you grow and you evolve. Uh, and so launch day came. It was the 14th of October 2013, so just over a year ago now, uh, that we flipped the switch. Uh, and one of the great things, the thing that I'm most happy about this process that we went through, this transition, is that when we flipped the switch, it didn't mean that Ghost became open source from this point onwards, from f the 14th of October onwards. There's actually an entire history of over a thousand issues on GitHub that people could go back through and, and read and to understand the processes that we had and how we'd come to decisions. The entire development process became open. Um, I'm sure you can imagine that uh, the two or three days after going live was absolute insanity. It was madness. Um, as I said, we'd had like roughly a thousand issues up until that point. That was from like eight months of development time. 
over two days, we had like another 100 issues raised. Loads and loads of people coming into the project and, and, and getting involved. And, and, and there was all sorts of different kinds of issues. People asking questions, people getting stuck installing, people who wanted to make changes, the obligatory, can we switch to stylus, please, uh, post, uh, and a couple of other similar sorts of things. Uh, and you know, all of those issues warranted a reply. You, you took your time and, and, and responded to all these people. But it wasn't just me. It wasn't just me. It was that entire team. Every single one of them pitched in and helped respond to people and tell them, you know, this is how the Ghost Project works. This is what the Ghost Project is aiming to do. Here's our roadmap. Here's our planned features. This is, you know, this is us. And what was amazing to watch was that over the course of just a couple of days, how quickly new people got, dare I use the word, assimilated into our culture. Like you go from people asking questions one day to the next day, like also spouting back, well, this is how Ghost Project works, to other people who are coming to join in. And just how quickly the community grew and evolved and, and everyone join, joining in, uh, having this sort of shared culture. And so, uh, there's a, there was a real benefit that we could see to having like, built up a smaller team in, in private before we went public, and that was that we had this real foundation of a community, uh, a sort of a rock that could uh, carry the rest of the, of the project as we went public, because there was so much interest. And perhaps that's a negative side to having sort of tried to build hype around a project during the Kickstarter campaign, um, that sort of onslaught of people coming at you. Um, and that perhaps if you've got a, a project that sort of grows naturally in the open, that it would work just as well. But this was our experience. This is how we did it. And we were really, really pleased with how that went. So at this point, uh, we're now an open source project. And so we've got the challenges of open source to start dealing with. And I thought I would talk through just a couple of the challenges that we've had and, and focus very heavily on um, how we've gone about solving them. Um, so the first challenge, I suppose, that is a bit negative, so I kind of want to get it out of the way, and that's uh, coping with people who are outwardly negative towards your project. Um, and it's kind of a big discussion area in open source. It's, a very, it's a quite a common occurrence. That there will be people that come and join the project who don't contribute, but in fact they uh, have a negative impact on your project. They take too much of the other developer's time, or they, you know, they cause emotional drain, and you know their, their impact's negative. It's not always deliberate. You know, it's not like these people are going out of your way to troll you all the time. It's just that you know some people's way of working perhaps doesn't fit with your culture, or, or whatever. And uh, there's a really great talk actually by Ben Colin Sussman and Brian Fitzpatrick, who are from the Subversion Project. Um, and it's on YouTube, you might have seen it, and if you're interested in this, go watch it. It's called Surviving Poisonous People. I mean, that's quite an aggressive term to use for these people. But um, they, they, they cover a whole wide range of behaviours that you see in open source, and the ways that people will interact with the project, and how it can cause a negative impact, and also how to counter it. But, you know, in all honesty, in my experience, those people that have, are... are few and far between, they are the minority. The majority of people that you come into contact with when you're working in open source are fantastic. They've all got the same goal in mind, they want to make the software better. Uh, but I want to talk about a slightly more like, generalised problem that I've noticed um, over the past year. And I think this tweet kind of like, explains it quite well. Um, it's by Andrew Nesbitt, who's a friend of mine. Um, and he, uh, he's worked for GitHub for a while and been involved in, in open source very heavily. And he said, open source maintenance requires such a thick skin. People tell you you're doing wrong a lot more than thanking for the continued support. So the idea that you know, maintaining an open source project might be a little bit of a thankless task sometimes. And it's quite true. Um, and I think, in part, this sort of, this, this sense, this, this sort of, emotional response you kind of end up having to the negativity. Um, it's, it's, it's due to a problem with the way that people go around using GitHub. So if you think about, you know, here I am, I've got my project on GitHub, and people are going to come to my repository and start you know, raising issues. And that could be a bug, it could be a feature request, it could be a change request, all manner of concerns that they might have about the software. Um, but all of those people, when they do turn up, they're all already, usually, users of your software. And what I've noticed is that even though in the most cases they are developers, you know, they, 
they, they, most people on, on GitHub are technical or developers. They sort of take their developer hat off and put their user hat off on when they write an issue. And so rather than it being like a constructive bug report, you very often get that sort of frustrated user content in GitHub, which can, you know, be quite difficult to deal with. Um, so yeah, you see people raising bugs uh, and not really giving you the information that you need to solve it, or people just sort of ranting about their frustrations with the software. And I find it quite weird that that lives on GitHub. Um, because the problem for me as an open source manager is that it puts the users of the software and the developers of the software in constant direct contact. Now, if I'm a manager in a, in a company, in an office environment, or just a traditional tech company, and I, I'm managing a team of developers, part of that role is acting as a bit of a shield for that sort of emotional user content. So, you know, I would work with maybe a, a product manager or an account manager, and we'd take user feedback and you'd distill it into a, a nice constructive bug report and take out any of the sort of more emotional content before you show it to your developers. And I can't do that on GitHub. I have no way to shield my developers from that content. There's no way to protect them. And that's even more frustrating to me when you think that every single one of those developers, every single one of those people is donating their time to me for free, and they're having to put up with that kind of negativity. And I mean, it's not all bad. I, it comes across as it's really negative, but you know, it's just that kind of subtle difference between a bug report that's written from a developer hat and from a user hat. And um, I've learned one, I guess, really important lesson about responding to people on GitHub and how you talk to people on GitHub in order to convert that energy into positive energy and, and, and to try and uh, divert the discussion to being constructive and to being, uh, you know, about solving problems. And it's about these three little phrases. Hi, welcome, and thank you. And uh, it's, it's absolutely obvious to me now when I look back. But when I first started responding to people on GitHub in those you know, first few days when we launched originally, people you know, were coming at us thick and fast, and you didn't have a great amount of time to reply. I think I actually sat down st still for like 10 hours without moving, you know, replying to people. And, uh, it just didn't occur to me to, to say any of these sorts of things. What I was doing was I was responding directly to the concern that the person was presenting me with. You know, if they were saying to me, oh, I think I found a bug, and would, I would just say, that's not a bug, that's our, our intended functionality, and here's why. Be polite and, and give a good reason, but you know, just sort of get on with it, get direct to business. And uh, the way I think about it is, is cause, because GitHub to me is my workplace. If I'm sat at my desk in an, in, in an office where you know, I'm working with my coworkers, and one of them comes over to my desk and says, hey, that code that you wrote yesterday has got a bug in it. It does this. I don't turn around to my coworker and go, hi, John, welcome to my desk. Thank you for pointing this out to me, but uh, I am afraid that that isn't actually a bug. That is our intended functionality. That's how the product designer wanted it, or whatever else. That's not the way you react to people. You just go, nah, mate. That's just you know, that's not how it's done. Uh, and so that was my mindset when I was replying to people on GitHub. But of course, all of those people that were coming to talk to me, they were all new to me. They didn't know me. They weren't like a coworker that had that kind of uh, assumed knowledge that you, you know your mates or whatever, um, or just that you know each other. They're all new. They've all com and they're all completely new to, to the project. They don't have that understanding of how we're working yet. They don't know about our culture, how we deal with issues. They don't realise that I wasn't you know trying to be off offhand. You know, I was just responding to their concern. Uh, and it became really apparent because I started to get quite a lot of like negative responses or angry replies to people who really felt like I hadn't taken them seriously and that I was sort of uh, brushing them aside and that like the ghost community was closed and that nobody else was allowed to join. There was like, a couple of comments like this. And it dawned on me uh, as I saw how other projects were doing it and how other people speak to each other on GitHub that what I was doing was I was failing to recognise that they were a human being. And that by saying hi at username, you acknowledge them. You acknowledge that they're a person, that they've got frustrations and, and opinions, and that they, you know, that they have value. And that just that's, that one act of saying hello sort of takes away that feeling of not being taken seriously. And then when you point out to them, you know, here are the guidelines or whatever it is that you need to explain, um, they're much more comfortable taking that on board. And, and the discussions just tend to go 
uh, much more positively, much more constructively from that point on, onwards. So these are my three watchwords, hi, welcome, and thank you on GitHub. Um, and it doesn't always work. I have to say that. I have actually seen someone reply on GitHub to one of these sorts of comments. I thank you would have been nice. But there is one. Did you want another one? I'm, I'm confused. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you can't please everyone. Um, but being nice really, really helps. Um, and apparently it's not something I'm very good at by default. Uh, oh well, I'm learning, I'm growing as a human being. It's all good. Uh, so let's... Uh, talk about a different subject. Let's talk about managing user demand. And I'm not talking necessarily about those sort of users on GitHub. I'm talking about the general user base. Uh, we get feedback from all manner of places. Because we've got a hosting service that's got a private support email address, so we get lots of emails where people tell us what they think. Um, and we openly encourage people to tell us everything, you know, all of their experiences with Ghost. We've got our forum where we get lots of people coming to talk about uh, self-installs and uh, the trying to hack Ghost to do different things. Obviously, there is GitHub. And uh, all of those sorts of places give us lots of feedback about um, how, what users want from Ghost. But when we originally launched, uh, we had this roadmap. We had this plan of what 1.0 Ghost looked like. And it was like the, basically what we'd promised or, or shown in the Kickstarter campaign, this sort of profile of this idea of, of an ideal blogging platform. And what we'd done was we'd listed out all of the features that we wanted to build, and we sort of grouped them together into projects. And then we assigned them to a, like a, a milestone, which was going to be a version. So, you know, Ghost 0.3 is going to be like this, and Ghost 0.4 will have this. And um, we had it all planned. We had it all nailed, right? Um, but then we started to analyze that user feedback and realized that if we delivered our roadmap, we wouldn't be delivering the features that users really wanted until like months and months and months away. Um, and the, you know, the ordering was all wrong, so there was one problem. The second problem was that, of course, the roadmap slipped. Um, we're dealing with open source software. Not everything can be guaranteed. Um, the amount of resources that you have at any one, one time is, is completely variable. So you know, it just wasn't working. And, and what it did was it pro provided uh, a source of frustration for users, because they would say, well, you said that Ghost 0.4 was going to have this feature, and it doesn't. And uh, we would ma we'd made all these promises that we just couldn't deliver on. So what we decided was that we would um, sort of completely switch our thinking. Let's not try and plan out the whole road to 1.0. Let's get, lots, get a lot more agile. So we ditched the wiki page that was a list, that was the roadmap, and we started a Trello board instead, in which every card is a feature. We've got columns, and on those columns, um, you have like the in-progress column for features that are currently being worked on, things that are ready to work on if, if someone's interested, and then the backlog of just general features that we'd want to build. Um, and that roadmap is completely in flux, um, because what we do is we pick up the features that have a balance between user demand and being ready to work on. And we'll work on a feature for a while, and then maybe it gets blocked on something. It isn't quite as ready to, to release as we thought. So it sort of goes back out of the in-progress column, and we pick something else up. Um, but the other difficulty that we had with our roadmap plan was shipping. Because we'd like, had this idea that you know, we'll ship 0.4 when it's got all these features, we would wait. We'd wait and wait and wait and wait until all the features were ready. And releases got delayed and delayed and delayed. And uh, it also caused a problem because you know, one feature wasn't ready, but another one had been started on. And so now the interface was a bit broken or something. And it became really hard to like, cut, a, cut a point where you could release the software. Um, we were just going about it all wrong. So. Um, we tried working on feature branches as well, and we canned that idea because the Ghost co code base actually moves so quickly, it's almost impossible to keep them up to date. Um, we refactor and, and improve the code like every week, so it just doesn't work. So what we decided to do was start building each new feature behind, that had a, a visual component behind a config flag. So uh, we could build it away in, in secret sort of thing. And anybody who was interested could have a look at how it was coming on, but it didn't impact on our users, which meant that we could release whenever we want to. So now we try to get a balance of shipping uh, at least one new visual feature that people can play with, uh, a couple of bug fixes on the last couple of features that we released, and then uh, the refactoring work that we do, and also that kind of inf infrastructural projects that you need to do in order to build the features of the future. So kind of get a balance across the whole range of stuff and cut releases once a month and ship it. 
um, and the, the new roadmap and, and this new way of shipping is, is much, much better for us. But it's really brand new. We've only just been doing it for a couple of months. Um, but that will still leaves the question of how. How do you go about doing all that? How do you get people to work on features? How do you manage an open source project with loads of volunteer contributors? And the answer is really simple. You don't. It's like herding cats. There's literally no magic pearl answer for this. I, well, or if there is, I don't know it yet. Uh, it's just about building relationships with the people that join the community, about learning who's good at what, and about asking really nicely, asking people, you know, would you like to work on this feature? Do you think that you could ship it by this time? Um, if not, when do you think you could ship it by? And, and sort of trying to get some sort of verbal contract with people. And the one thing that I can tell you is, in the majority of cases, if someone says to you, I will ship this by so-and-so, they will do it. They just will. Um, and I find that amazing. I mean, open source blows me away every day. The fact that people are willing to give their free time up to, talk, to work on our project is just fantastic. Um, but yeah, so, so managing this project and, and is all about talking to people. It's about asking nicely. It's also about selling the importance of the work that needs doing, because a lot of development work can seem really boring. Like, yeah, it's not a cool new feature. I don't really want to work on that. So selling the importance of why you know, doing a piece of infrastructural work is interesting, or how it's going to deliver value, and how it might be fun to work on. Um, but also, when, pro when issues are sort of languishing, there and, and you know that they're, they're just not getting picked up on. Um, I found a really good trick is to close them and reopen them. Um, <laughs> and uh, reword them a little bit, maybe add a little bit more hyperbole and try and make them a little bit more exciting. Or maybe sort of split them up in a slightly different way to sort of cut out the really, really hard part or something. Um, and that tends to get things moving, especially because you, know, you get new people joining the repository all the time, watching the repository. So they see those issues getting open. They don't necessarily go back through the history. Um, so that's a really good trick, um, and ultimately, you know, we do. We are lucky at Ghost that we have the fallback option. We have paid developers like me who will, you know, take on the stuff that nobody else wants and get it done, and you know, has that pressure. Um, so, uh, one last point on the sort of challenges of open source um, is that people naturally come and go from your project, and you have to. Um, try to entice new contributors to come and fill the gap. And also, you kind of want to grow the project. So um, this is something that I noticed really, really recently, is that there seems to be a correlation between when we do a little bit of a marketing push and get a, a, a peak in a sort of new user signups on ghost.org, we also seem to get like an influx of new people on the GitHub repository which kind of goes against my initial thinking that it would be about marketing the source code as being fun to work on. This sort of suggests that actually it might be about marketing the product as being fun to work on. And so I'm, I need to go away and crunch the numbers and figure out if that's really happening. Um, but if it is, I think you know, it's a really interesting point about how to attract new contributors. So we've been a functioning open source project for a year. Um, and it's not just been about challenges and dealing with problems. It's not just been hard. Ghost simply wouldn't exist if it wasn't for open source. Um, it, I, I'm never going to get bored of waking up in the morning to pull requests. The fact that progress happens while I'm asleep is fantastic. And we are, as a foundation, fully invested in the process of being open. And so we're constantly reviewing what we're doing and looking for new ways to be better. So I thought I'd finish on a couple of points about how we're trying to improve our engagement and being more open. At the beginning of this year, we realized that our admin panel uh, wasn't working out for us. We built it in Backbone, and it was just really hard to build on top of. We weren't able to sort of add new features easily. Uh, and we decided we needed to rewrite it. Now, this meant we needed to revisit our original decision to use Backbone, which we'd made when we were in that sort of safe, invite-only bubble. This meant that we needed to have a discussion about what was best, Backbone, Ember, or Angular. And those sorts of discussions are usually emotionally charged and lacking in sort of uh, the sort of constructive content. You know, they tend to be bike sheds. And I was really, really worried and nervous about how we would have this sort of discussion when we were completely open. Um, so what I did was I sort of sat down and thought about how to approach it and, and decided I'd raise the issue that I would describe all of the problems that we had with the existing solution and ask people to come and share their experiences of these different frameworks but tell us which one they thought would be best at solving those particular problems, rather than which one was best in general. 
And that worked. It worked amazingly well. We had over 100 comments, some of them like 800 words long, with people coming and sharing their experiences of working with Backbone, working with Angular, and working with Ember, and, and giving us a genuine like, appreciation of what they thought um, would be the best solution for us. And we were able to pick Ember. Um, and that was the first time that I really gained absolute confidence in the process of being open, that we could do all of these things, have all of these topics without them getting railroaded or ended up being flame wars or you know, whatever else. Um, you, know, you can discuss these things and open it, and, and what happens is magical because it brings all of these people together to discuss the topic. Another thing that happened uh, really recently this year is that we started giving out commit rights to the community. Our original plan was actually to... Um, keep commit right to something that would be employee only. Um, because we think of Ghost as being a project, and we were really worried about the idea of, of other people being able to add, add software that would then get shipped to our customers. Um, but then one of, our, one of our community members came to us and said, hey, I really don't like that. I don't like the idea that me, as a volunteer contributor, no matter how hard I work or how much time I give you, I will never be given the same level of respect and authority in this project as your employees. It makes employees first-class citizens. And at first, we sort of said, you know, this is because we're a product, and this is how we think about this. And then we realized we were completely off base, totally wrong. We were letting fear get the better of us. And it's just a matter of trust. If you, give op if you give commit rights to the people that you trust to have excellent judgment, then there's, there's literally nothing to be worried about because you know they're going to make the right decisions. You know they're not going to merge stuff that's going to break the build. Um, and at the end of the day, this is Git, right? So nothing is unrecoverable. Um, and this has been an enormous, enormous benefit to the project. We only did it at the beginning of September, and uh, our project started to move much, much, much faster. Because it's not just me that's sort of reviewing and merging pull requests. Um, there's other people with, with other skill sets as well getting involved and moving the project forward. And it's, uh, the other benefit is that it's given me some time to sort of step back a little bit and plan more of the sort of big picture of the future and so on and so forth, and, and sort of figuring out how to be better at being open and, and communicate it. Um, so uh, that leads me on to the last point here, which was that we um, need to get better at communicating the long-term vision of the product. Um, and, the, and that's actually something that I think we're always going to be trying to get better at, because it's really hard to pin down the mix of really fleeting ideas that we have and the well-considered ones. And by the time you've written them down, they've invariably changed. So we're always going to be striving to do better on this. And uh, I literally couldn't have planned this if I tried in any way, shape, or form. Um, we have an open source development meeting every week at 5.30 on a Tuesday in an IRC channel and where we talk about the progress that we've made in the last week and what's a priority moving forward. And apparently this week we had a, an observer, a vocal observer, who came in and was really impressed by our meeting. Um, saying that we're taking the open and open source to the, new level, to the next level. And this is where we want to be. We want to be out there proving that our idea of open source works, that you can be non-profit, that you can have a business model, that you can push open source to do amazing things. We, want to be, you know, we really want to sell this idea that other people could start businesses like this. So I guess the last and final note to make is please get involved. Like, please get involved. Not just in Ghost. I mean, you've seen an amazing example of another open source project already today. There are thousands upon thousands on GitHub um, uh, that you could take a step towards and get involved. And I don't know how many of you have already, you know, maybe raised a bug request. Maybe you have your own open source projects. Maybe there are some of you which haven't done this yet. Um, and there are enormous benefits to, to contributing. And I know that the feedback that I get from my contributors is that it make, it's vastly improved their job prospects. Um, but yeah, so please do get involved. If you are interested, you can visit ghost.org. We have a developer blog where the meeting write-ups get posted. Um, try ghost slash ghost on GitHub. That's the IC channel. Come and say hello. And finally, thank you for listening. <laughs>